Two weeks after I moved to DC, somebody got killed on my front gate. Wow. A month later, somebody was shot on my porch. A lot of African Americans that are coming to Ghana, not only do they have those two 23 kilo bags, they got some other bags, some extra baggage mm. called trauma that they bring with them. Mm. If you're somebody who's making $150,000 a year, you're wasting your time. Yeah. I hear a lot of people talk about the American dollar is going to fall and it's going to be replaced on the world stage. I don't believe that, mainly because I believe that America is too egotistical. Will the U.S. dollar collapse? It's a question a lot of people are asking. A lot of videos are going viral on Instagram, TikTok. Oh my God, what would happen? I'm like, a war will happen before the American dollar falls. Mark my word. We have a serious thing of Stockholm Syndrome. Indigenous African people love their oppressors more. If I'm in a store and there's a white person in the store, in Ghana, the average Ghanaian person in that store will rush to help this white person before me. Now we coming from a place where our oppressors whipped us and hung us and raped our mothers in our face. It's harder for us to love them. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so when we see them, we like, what? Do you see a lot of um, people grew up to embody people like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? In it's place. a different time, bro. We never gonna have the great black leader anymore. Why Number one, Number one, you're too scared. They all got assassinated. Who want to step up to get assassinated? <laughs> Malcolm X got assassinated. Martin Luther King got assassinated. Jomo Kenyatta got assassinated. Thomas Sankara got assassinated. Every great black leader, right, was assassinated. 80% of African Americans, stop pretending, cannot afford to come to Africa. The same people who you saying can't afford it, in a week's time, they're gonna wear $1,500 worth of tennis shoes on their feet in a week's time. It's priority. Yes. Definitely. On Monday, if I'm wearing a pair of Jordan 1s, and on Tuesday, if I'm wearing a pair of LeBrons, and on Wednesday, if I'm wearing a pair of KDs, then I got a pair of ancient Air Max. So it's my sneaker collection. I can buy lands in Africa. Yes, it could buy land, it could buy tickets. I had one of my friends said, dog, you always in Africa. I said, you always got a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode. And this is the Diaspora Transition episode. We interviewed diaspora who decided to leave the diaspora, either the UK, US, Caribbean countries, and currently living here on the continent. We speak with people who are doing great things here on the continent there. And uh, today we do have someone very special, very, very special indeed. He's been on the continent for a number of years now. He's behind, you know, the year of return. I've done so many projects here and actually I'm very privileged to have him here on the show to really speak about his journey, even the first time he decided to come to Africa and how that came about. So without further ado, Diallo, Mr. Diallo, welcome on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to Yami Bet today. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this place is amazing. It's beautiful, peaceful, serene, quiet. Why did you decide to leave Accra just to, to come to Koforidia? Well, I actually left Kofodria to go to Accra. Oh. Because this is my home mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the first place I came when I came here. But, you know, sometimes you got to get out of the city. The hustle, the grind, all of that is very real in Accra. It's like people say New York is the city that never sleeps, but Accra is really the city that never sleeps. <laughs> and sometimes you just need a break. Yeah. So yeah. I try to come out here. Well, one is my responsibility and two for my own mental health to just I like that I like that you know now today we have, I want to dive into your story you know I've okay. seen you everywhere I've seen you do great things you know for a number of years now on the continent and uh, I really want to have a backstory on you you know today so you tell your story just not to even just lesson sake but to inspire people to embark on a journey that you did you know to the continent and been doing amazing things here you, you've been instilled as the chief of uh, development. You know, it's very mm -hmm. inspirational being an African-American. So I want to today to, you know, be a, a, almost a throwback to how this came about. So people watching you for the first time, if they don't know who you are, can you please briefly introduce yourself and then we take it from there. Cool. Uh, my name is Diallo Sumber, born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. We have a bridge that say Trenton makes and the world takes. Mm. Uh, moved to DC with my family. Um, you know, grew up attending independent African-centered schools mm. in D.C. Um, in, in D.C. and in New Jersey. Um, you know, grew up family. I grew up in the cultural arts. Mm. So mm. I was one of those people who grew up and I always knew that Africa was a continent. Mm. You know, I was never you never had to correct me if I say the country of Africa. Right? I always knew it was a continent. So I grew up in the culture. 
mainly through performing arts. Mm. West African drum dance through the Djembe Orchestra, Katero, Sabah, and a lot of the Francophone countries, Mandin mm. culture. Mm. Um, and, you know, around Ghanaian culture too, just in general, African culture. I'm the product of parents who came out of the 1960s Black Power Movement mm -hmm. and decided that they would go back to Africa, mm. right? Mm. And a lot of times in that sense, it wasn't physical, but it was just kind of reconnect with your roots. You give all your kids African names. You wear African clothes. You, want, you, you begin bridging that gap to mm. identify with this, the culture of who you are. Mm. And we did that um, growing up. So that's how I grew up. Um, now, how I came to this kind of professionally, because I, I like to say I've been a professional black person for a long time, right? <laughs> is I got to this crossroads. Mm. I came to this crossroads where it was kind of like, well, what do you do, mm. right? We all come to a professional crossroads where you could decide how you're going to spend the rest of your life. So I had a choice. Am I going to spend the rest of my life connecting mm. black people to Africa one way or another? Or am I going to spend the rest of my life doing something else? Um, and this is what I love doing. Hmm. I felt as though this was my calling and I kind of felt like I found my purpose. Hmm. I felt like I found it early on mm -hmm. and it transitioned from connecting people to African culture hmm. to connecting people to the African continent. Hmm. So it was almost like the next step. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is my life mission. Like I feel like I found the thing, right? You know how you've heard people say that, you know, if you find something that you love doing, it won't ever feel like a job. Mm, it's mm, just mm -hmm. you get to wake up and live every day mm -hmm. so that's kind of my backstory so to speak um have brothers sisters large community back home in dc trent new jersey really around the world um the first time i traveled to the african continent was 1988 1988 i might be dating myself but 1980 i know i look 19 fresh and young <laughs> but it was like <laughs> 1988 um then I went again in like the 90s, early 90s. Both my first two times I went for performances mm -hmm. or cultural art learning. Um, again, music, culture, dance, performing arts. And then I kind of fell in love with Africa. And I spent a lot of time traveling back and forth to Senegal mm -hmm. um, for most of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, Guinea Conakry, you know, passing through Mali, passing through some of those other Francophone countries. And I didn't come to Ghana till 2014, my wow. first time. Wow. Even though I have a lot of family members in D.C., New York, and other places who have been coming to back and forth to Ghana for 30 years, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Like, Ghana's not new to our people. Um, but my first time in Ghana was 2014. Mm -hmm. And when I came, I came to this place where we are now, Kwame Yorinchi Village in Yame Bechede. And I was here for about four weeks, and then I went back to America. Mm -hmm. But why specifically this village, though? So I met uh, my teacher, mm. almost like a spiritual father mm. in the U.S. Okay. And he's um, Ghanaian? He's Ghanaian. His name is Nanayao Yorinchi Jabi the first. Mm. He's the Akonfo uh, Hini uh, uh, of the Nana Konadi Shrine in Latte, Ghana. Mm. Oh, Latte. Yes. Oh, wow. So I met him. Now, I was familiar with Ghanaian culture around familiar i was familiar with that um growing up the way i grew up we became familiar with a lot of different cultural systems spiritual systems foods dance drum like all of those things kind of move together they're all aspects of culture in some sense mm -hmm. so when i met him i came here went through a process with him um i got so i got to my point as a man in life where I felt like I wasn't going to get to the next level of life, whatever that was, mm. unless I had more spiritual discipline. Don't even ask me what spiritual discipline is. I'm still learning. But I knew that I had reached the ceiling. Mm. And whatever it was, I couldn't get to the next one. So I began working with him, studying with him, training with him for a number of years. And then I came here to complete that training. And when I completed it, that introduced me to Ghana. Mm. I came back in 2016. And when I came back in 2016, right here in this very house, um, I sat down with him and he told me he had a message for mm. me. And the message was that if you choose Ghana and if you decide to move to Ghana and, you know, plant some roots in Ghana, do some work in Ghana, things will go very well for you. Mm. Wow. Everything will conspire. The universe will conspire. The ancestors, the spirits, everybody would support you. Mm. 
and you will That's be deep. successful. That's deep. That's exactly what happened. So at that point in my life, mm. I had gotten to the point where I had decided that I wasn't going to question the voices anymore. Mm. I would just listen and obey. Just wow. in general. Mm. Because, you know, sometimes you hear things and then you question what's the voice. So you hear do this mm -hmm. and you don't do it. You've been stubborn. <laughs> right? But mm. you, you hear it clearly. So at that point, I had already decided that I wasn't going to question. I was just going to listen and obey. So when he said that, I said, okay, this is 2016, like um, first half of the year. Um, I said, okay, well, let me come back. Now let me come back on an official scouting trip. Like, let me come back to see what Ghana's like. Came in early 2016. Um, one of my uncle's community uncles was having a retirement celebration. He brought over a dance company that my sister and cousins dance with. And I just knew a lot of people coming. So I bought my own ticket, came mm. with them. Moved around Ghana a little bit, met people. Um, came back again that November, around Thanksgiving of 2017. Mm. And that was when I decided to move around Ghana on my own. So I said, if this is going to be the place where I'm going to live mm. or where I'm possibly going to do business, I need to feel the people. Mm. 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 I need to feel what the people feel like and get mm. the vibe, right? Because when you're from the hood, you got to keep your head on a swivel. So you got to know, like, where am I? Mm. <laughs> is this the right place to be? Is this a safe place for me? What's the spirit of the people? If I bump somebody, do I got to fight or will we apologize? You just got to figure everything out, right? So I came and I told them, don't nobody pick me up from the airport. I'm coming on my own. I was like, how do I get to you? I'm bet today. Hmm. They said, oh, from the airport, you catch the Chocho or taxi to Medina. You tell Medina you need to go to Kaforja. Once you get to Kaforja, you tell them you bet today. Wow. And then you can do drop in or this. So they told me that. I just heard it and mm -hmm. I just followed instructions. Mm -hmm. I got to the airport, took my suitcase. I need to go to Medina. I got to Medina. I need to go to Kaforja. I got to Kaforja. I need to go to Yame Bechere. Showed up on the roadside. So they like, hey, you can't. I did what you told me to do, right? So that was my first, let me see where I'm at, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I got to tell you a, another story later about my first time because I almost, almost got in a fight with the whole damn Medina bus station. Wow. Um, Exercise and patience because... This is how I learned the Trotro system. I'm waiting on the Trotro. And it's like two hours past, and I'm like, boss, when is the Trotro, when is the bus leaving, dog? This don't make no sense. I'm fresh off the boat, fresh out of America. This don't make no sense. I've been sitting on here for two hours. Oh, we need more people. Another hour come. Dog, I, now I'm losing it. After the fourth hour, I was like, yo, give me my money back. He said, I'm not giving you your money back. How you not going to give me my money back? I just sat here. The, it ain't move. So at this point, I feel like, oh, they trying to take advantage of me. Mm. How can you not give me my money back? I'm just sitting mm -hmm. here. I sat here for four hours. I didn't understand how the Trocho system worked. So then I went and took the key out wow. of the ignition of the Trocho. Hey, worst mistake ever. Wow. I got surrounded by about 50 dudes. <laughs> the whole Medina surrounded me. Medina Trocho stayed surrounded me. And they all up in arms. And at this point, I'm looking around like, shit, <laughs> I can't fight all these motherfuckers. So an old man steps up. He steps in the middle. He, said, he asked me a very simple question. Do you want us to manage you? Mm. And I just thought, damn, that's a, that's a hard question. Mm. I don't want to be managed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be managed by nobody else. So I said no. So then I gave him the key. He made the guy give me my money back. Then I just wind up paying more money and taking a car. Mm. Right. So anyway, that's that was early in my trip, story. early in my trip, because you didn't know. And yeah. a lot of us come here with impatience. Mm -hmm. So I came. And at that point, I had already taken a, done a couple trips to Africa, but mainly to I did one to Guinea with my performing group, Fadafina Khan. And then I did one to Senegal for a couple people. Mm. Um, but it wasn't my business. Right. It wasn't what I did. Um, so then I went on Facebook mm -hmm. and I was like, yo, who want to come to Ghana with me? A lot of people wanted to. A lot of people said yes. So then I started planning my first trip for November 2017, one year later. Um, I was at that point. I was I was working virtually and in an office. I had two or three jobs. I had already decided that I wanted to take a go go bring a go go band to Africa. Mm -hmm. 
So go-go music is very African, is regional to DC. Heavy percussion, call and response from the lead talker and the band to the crowd. Um, and, and if you from DC, you know the go-go. So it was already in my, it's been in my mind for years, mm -hmm. right? Big G from the Backyard Band to tell you, for years I've been telling them, I'm gonna take y'all to Africa, I'm gonna take y'all to Africa. This is a whole nother story, but I had an outer body experience in the go-go one time mm -hmm. where I felt like I left my body and I was watching the go-go and I'm like, damn, this is all African music. And I felt like the drum rhythm was playing some kind of pattern that put us in a trance mm. and we were fighting each other. The go-go used to be a lot of fights. But I was just like, everybody don't know why. No one, no one could possibly know why is this many fights breaking out. I'm talking about no, numerous fights all over the club breaking out. So at that point I realized we was all in this trance mm. and we were being fed this warrior energy and we didn't know what to do with it. Mm. So we, you know, everybody just, you just, you don't want nobody to touch you. You just, you with your crew and everybody want to dominate. So I had this idea. So I had been planning to bring a go-go band here. Um, as fate would have it, I wind up meeting Mr. Kwesi Ajman, current mm. CEO for mm. Ghana Tourism Authority. Mm -hmm. I met him in Washington, D.C. I think he was about six months into his post after the current president was elected. And I told him what I was doing, that I had people signing up and I was bringing people. He's like, but how many people you got signed up? I'm like, a hundred. He's like, a hundred. Hmm. Like, who, who you working with? I'm like, me. You. Like, kind of. Yeah. So I'm like, look, I'll be in Ghana later. Somewhere along the way, um, I got contacted by a middle school with a connection from my brother. And they said, well, we want to take our eighth grade students to Ghana. So I wind up planning another trip mm -hmm. before my first scheduled trip. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, things started happening. I pitched to him, yo, I got this back to Africa thing that I'm doing, bringing this go-go band. We want to do this. We want to do that. These people signed up. Okay, they came. Came. We signed the MOU with Ghana Tourism Authority. So 2016, mm -hmm. I came twice. 2017, I came four times. 2018, I came eight times. Wow. None of these were planned out at mm -hmm. the beginning of the year. I'm mm -hmm. going to go to Ghana. Mm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It was just, we, I really just moved with spirit, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, when I, the yeah. way I'm telling yeah. you, like, the Literally, moment. it's 2023, and I'm just now kind of taking a pause mm. to, to reflect, back. to go back. Like, I, I paused during the pandemic a little bit, to, but now I'm really like... You've been, you've been doing so much here on the continent. You like, brought more than 1,000 people. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've done, we've done it. We've done 1,000 people, definitely. We did that in 2019. Mm -hmm. But, so, um, things started happening. Mm. And then you just, I just kind of be, became a part of the fabric, mm. right? In that quest um, to bring more people here, it, first of all, let me just say, because people always debate this. A million people knew mm. that 2019 was going to be 400 years mm. from 1619. Every black American, white person, if you learn U.S. history in school, you learn that 1619 was the beginning of America, slavery, mm. Jamestown, Virginia. You learned that. Those of us who have a little more knowledge know that Africans traversed the world well before 1619. Mm -hmm. And Africans traversed the world mm -hmm. prior to being enslaved mm -hmm. on our own. Mm -hmm. We navigated the world. Mm -hmm. We discovered astronomy, mathematics, science, all of those things. Look at all of the ancient, you know, Kemet, Nubia, mm -hmm. Songhai, mm -hmm. Mali, Ghana Empire long before the Arab invasion, long before the European invasion. So let's just put that mm -hmm. out there, right? Cause so your listeners know, I know that. Yeah. Because some people like to debate, well, why are you yeah. saying 400 years? Listen, so in this conversation with Mr. Ajman, trying to figure out how do we bring more people? How do we get here? A lot of people had the idea that 400 years, and people were planning their own things 400 years. I feel like... I was in the right place at the right time, and I was an acceptable mm. and willing vehicle. Mm. The ancestors and the spirits was on our side, and they said, this is your assignment, mm. and if you do what you're supposed to do, we're going to do what, I'm, what we're supposed to do, and it's going to happen. Mm. Because if I tell you every single thing that led up to literally uh, His Excellency Nanado Akufado saying 2019 is going to be the year of return and all those little things that had to happen mm. is nothing short of a miracle. Mm. It's mm. not a normal memo. Mm. It's not a normal 
cement build a parliament policy. Mm. Mm. And I happen to be a very integral part of that. Yes, you right? have been. Have <laughs> I been. happen to be the person yes. to say to Ms. Ajman, 400 years, you can't do it 420, you can't do 450, you can't do 475. If you don't do it now, we got to wait 100 years. Mm. 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 And he gets a humongous amount of credit mm. because it was his risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's his job to promote tourism in Ghana, not mine. Mm. 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 So I could have had a, mi a million ideas mm -hmm. and pitched them, but somebody has to say, yes, mm. I'm going to stand behind this and make it happen and, and make the connections. Mm. So that's why I have a lot of respect for him today. And his, his work ethic is unmatched, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Could he do more? Could Ghana Tourism Authority do more? Can Beyond a Return do more? Can Ghana do more? Yes. Everybody can do more. We could probably talk a little bit about that. But it happened because you had a group of committed people pushing. Mm -hmm. But he and I know where and yeah. how it started. We were sitting on the same couch. <laughs> you you were part of it. You know, I, I know you don't like taking credit. But well, yeah, because... You, from what I've heard, you've done a lot. Yeah, you know, mainly because I don't want people to feel like you are trying to put yourself right. in front of this mm -hmm. entire movement. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you don't, they will erase you. Right, right. Right? They, and then you won't even have no say mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that helped. Once the horse is out the gate on something that big, it's out the gate. Mm -hmm. Nobody can control it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to so many other countries Im immediately after the year of return, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cameroon. Everybody, it's too late, y'all. Mm. Ghana did it first. You can't do this again. Nigeria you did that after Nigeria. That. You could do something, but it's not going to have this impact. Mm. Mm. It was so many things that added to it from Afrochella, which is now mm -hmm. Afro Future, mm -hmm. happening in December. Yeah. Most people who come here don't even know that December in Ghana was a thing well before the year of return. Yeah, yeah. December yeah. and Ghana were... But it changed year of return, changed the whole... It changed it. Yeah. Why did it change it? You know why? Mm. Because it brought us, mm. more of us. You know mm. who us is? African Americans. African Americans. Before, it was majority people from UK mm. Mm. coming home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So you got all these people who working in London, they work, they save up... $20,000, 15,000 pounds just to come and blow it in Ghana in December. Yes. <laughs> to have a good time for enjoyment and go back, right? Yeah. Or maybe save up yeah. enough and to And then leave after that. And they, they leave. They don't say do anything. But you come for vacation. You mm -hmm. coming home, though. Mm -hmm. But they coming home and they support the economy and go home. That was popping before mm. year of return. Year of return made it official. Mm. Mm. It made it super official that December in Ghana is the black mecca. Mm. It's the place to be. It is the hallmark, it is the center point, it is the middle of black excellence in the world. And that helped to shift this entire movement, mm -hmm. right? I like to say two things. Mm. That our job, what we've done so far, is simple things. The first thing that we've done is we've shortened the distance. Mm. So Between now the, coming to Africa is on the to-do list, not the bucket list. Mm. It's a That's big difference the, between saying I'm going to Africa next year mm -hmm. and... I hope I can make it to Africa before I die. Hmm. Let, let's, can we speak on that a little bit? Sure. I've had people comment down in my comment section that they want to move to the continent after watching a few videos, but it, it seems like they can't. And I don't seem to understand what might be. Is it money problem? Do you, as Quap said in the interview, that he believed that even 80% of African Americans can't really afford to come down here because of the system that is in the US with a debt trap and stuff like that. What, what do you have to say to someone like that? I'll say something a little different. I think more people can afford. I think it's choices. Mm. The same people who you saying can't afford it, in a week's time, they're going to wear $1,500 worth of tennis shoes on their feet. In a week's time. It's priorities. Yes. Let's talk about it, though. Let's <laughs> so talk about it. So on Monday, if I'm wearing a pair of Jordan 1s, and on Tuesday, if I'm wearing a pair of LeBrons, and on Wednesday, if I'm wearing a pair of KDs, then I got a pair of ancient Air Max. So if my sneaker collection... Right? Can buy lands in Africa. Yes, it could buy land, it could buy tickets. I had one of my friends said, Dog, you always in Africa. I said, You always got a new pair of shoes. <laughs> it's different priorities. When I knew I wanted to come here, the first commitment that I made was nothing will stop me from coming to Africa. Mm. Nothing. Mm. Wow. Especially not money. You, you seem to have a different upbringing from the other there's the pan-african in you that i who gave that to you mom dukes hmm. 
Mainly my mom. Mm. My, my, I, I didn't grow up with my pops, but my mom and my pops started us that way. Mm. Right? My father, he's deceased, rest in peace. Mm. Um, just a big shout out to him. Um, he was a big part of my life. He introduced me to the greatest fraternity in the world, Omega mm. Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Mm. And later on in my life, in his life, I'm glad that we were able to rebuild and build a father-son relationship mm. that I needed and that he needed before he passed away. Um, but my mom is the one who raised us mm. in like so the did African. He, did he track his even roots to the continent that motivated her to do what she did? No, I don't. I, I, I think, you know, you got people got to understand that in the 1960s, in America, that black power movement was strong. Mm. That say it loud. Mm. I'm black and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. That James Brown, yeah. that whole black power movement, right? The civil rights movement, mm -hmm. um, um, the Black Panthers, all of that stuff that was happening was black people saying we tired of being oppressed. oppressed yes. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, and it makes a lot of sense to me, the first thing you do when you're tired of getting oppressed is you get as close to Africa as possible. Mm. Why is that? Because there's this gap of your origin and your roots that you're trying to connect to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of people did in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you look at the alignment and the paralyzation from the African independence movement and the U.S. civil rights movement, those two things Alliance, led yeah. the entire world mm -hmm. in terms of African liberation fighters, people mm -hmm. fighting for liberation. Mm -hmm. The same time that uh, 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 airplane people. Africans... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In, indigenous Africans were here fighting for independence. Mm -hmm. We were fighting for civil rights. Mm -hmm. Same time. Mm -hmm. And Krumah had Maya Angelou, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy. He had all of these great civil rights come leaders to come mm -hmm. to Ghana and his, at his uh, inauguration. He's a member of a, of, of, of a, of a black fraternity, mm -hmm. Phi Beta Sigma. Mm -hmm. He went to Lincoln University at HBCU. He spent time on Harlem. Mm -hmm. Listening mm. to Marcus Garvey, he mm. studied. Mm. So Nkrumah developed his Pan-African spirit in the United States and then in London. Mm. And he brought a lot of that back to Africa. Mm. And then he came full circle from his worldly travels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've always kind of been together and been around. And if you look at it, this is our time and our generation to do our part. Mm -hmm. mm. It ain't better more or greater than the last generation. I like it's just our time to mm -hmm. do our part. Marcus Garvey did his part. Mm. Do, do you see a lot of um, people grow up to embody people like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? In this it's a case? different time, bro. We're never going to have the great black leader anymore. Why number one, number one, you're too scared. They all got assassinated. Who mm. want to step up to get assassinated? <laughs> Malcolm <laughs> X got assassinated. Martin Luther King got assassinated. Jomo Kenyatta got assassinated. Thomas Sankara got assassinated. Every great black leader, right, was assassinated. Hmm. And Krumah was damn near assassinated. He got, right? Yeah. Like, just think about it. Sekou Ture, mm -hmm. just think about what happened to every great black leader, a person who decided that they were going to unify Africa or be this person. Mm. So that's one thing. Number two, we're in a different time. Mm. They didn't have the internet back then. They didn't have the various means that we have in technology mm. to work and do things differently. The world was, we, they just came out of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Slavery had just ended 50 years before that. So civil rights, any kind of rights, people just kind of got their rights. Mm. White people finally let up and it ain't even that we fought, but they kind of let up and they was like, okay, I guess this is kind of wrong. Mm. Mm. We've been stealing people, murdering them, raping them, hanging them, lynching them. They obviously ain't going to die. I don't know what they made of. <laughs> I guess at some point we got to let up. So let's figure out how to put this system of oppression in a different way because the, the shackles ain't going to work no more. The whippings ain't going to work no more. They're not taking it. Right? So mental slavery. Distract them. Exactly. Do you think most African-American youth are distracted in the U.S.? I don't think that most African-American youth are more distracted than most Ghanaian youth. Mm, let's talk about I it. I think all youth are distracted because you're a youth. Mm. That's what youth do. Now, I'm talking about how our interests, you said priorities. I would rather buy a Jordan 1 than to move to the continent and buy a land to follow my route. The average Ghanaian youth would much rather buy Jordans more than the average American youth. And the average Ghanaian youth would rather buy Jordans and move out of Ghana 
to America mm -hmm. than to develop Ghana. Why do you think that is? Because look at what we see in the world. And who are you taught by? Let me say something. The problem in any generation will never be the youth. Young people don't know nothing. Mm. Mm. They grow up with who? Adults. Mm -hmm. Most of what they learn, they learn from who? Adults. Adults. So when they get to the point where they're formulating their own opinion, it's a collaboration of thoughts that they got from who? Mm. Adults. Mm. It's the adults that say you can't go outside, you have to go to school. This is the job you're going to get. This is the career you should have. This is this, this is that, this is this, this is that. It's the adults. So, like, you should never mm. put the problems of any one generation on young people as if mm. they have the power, the authority to do anything. They don't pay the bills at home, right? <laughs> they, it's not their job. So, I would say that all youth are distracted to a, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the adults around them job to guide them. What do you think we are doing wrong as black people in general? Oh, bro, that's a big question. I so, mean, when it comes to this, um, you know, uniting our powers, putting together our power, and, you know, being like the, the Chinese community, Lebanese community, and developing our... Um, what are we doing wrong in that? Aspect? I don't know that we're doing something wrong, right? And this... I've grown into my particular position right now, right? At one point, I just used to think, man, we are fucked up. We are fucked up people. We sick, we this, we that, we are fucked up people. Now I realize that when we compare ourselves to the Chinese, we com when we compare ourselves to the Lebanese, and we compare ourselves to other races and other people and say, you know, people say, oh, why couldn't Ghana be like Singapore? Hmm. Were the, was Singapore colonized on its land the way Ghana was by three or four different nations? Hmm. Was the infrastructure, like, yeah. granted, I'm not absolving us of our decisions that we can make now that can make us better, but it's apples and oranges. There are two sides to the colonization coin. Indigenous Africans will never know what it feels like to have 500 years of your history wiped out. You can probably go back to your grandmother, great-great-grandmother, grandfather, and you can probably spit out the history of your family mm. to the village, mm. to the tree, to the place where your great-great-grandmother maybe was even born. Mm. And you, there may be a house still there or a hut still there or some place where you could say, this is where we are from in this town. We can't do that. Mm. You guys will never know what that feels like. Mm. Right. Mm. And having to fight. Mm. And the same token, we'll never know what it feels like to be colonized on your own land. Mm. That's a whole different thing. Mm. Mm. So it's like, yes, African-Americans have had to endure slavery, but indigenous Africans have had to endure colonization on their own land. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? Sure. We had an hour length, maybe two hour conversation with someone about this topic yesterday. And I get the impression that we are often trying to put each trauma ahead of the other. Saying my trauma is more, um, you know, tough than yours. I, we've had that friction to almost mm -hmm. where the group were all fighting each other. And this you'd see a Ghanaian fighting an African-American brother who just came to Ghana, trying to, you know what I'm saying, contribute right. to, to track their roots. Speak on that a little bit with just... The I mean, we, most of us carry our trauma with us. Mm. A lot of African Americans that are coming to Ghana, to Ghana, not only do they have those two 23 kilo bags, they got some other bags, some extra baggage mm. called trauma that they bring with mm. them. That they got to figure out how to work through and work out. Because you bring it over here and it ain't going to translate. Nobody don't get it. They're not going to understand because we don't understand why you mad. Yeah. We don't understand mm -hmm. why you mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or we don't understand why you can't be patient. Mm -hmm. What you thought was patience is not patience. Mm -hmm. This is patience. Mm -hmm. Waiting three hours. Not mm -hmm. that 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is real patience. <laughs> right? So understanding that difference. So everybody carries trauma. Human development. You know, we carry it in our bones. We carry it in our responses, on our faces. And we just have to... Number one, recognize that and do better. But I completely agree that we compare our trauma. It's a trauma marathon. Who is the most abused child? It's kind of how we look at it. And we need more unification. And the only way that we're going to have that is through conversation. Mm. Mm. Only way this is going to work is by us sitting down and talking intentionally. Mm. Mm. Right? And mm. emerging. For example, 
I'm here in Yame Betcha. It's an obvious Ghanaian village. Yes. You come in, when you and my people here are speaking tree, mm -hmm. I don't know what y'all saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's chickens walking by. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I'm in the village. Yes. I'm here learning. I'm immersing myself. Mm -hmm. But when I'm here and in the morning and I decide to bring out the radio and I start playing Wu-Tang, mm, mm. or I start talking to them about cornbread, black mm. eyed peas, macaroni and cheese, Thanksgiving dinner. We don't understand. Or we that. start watching, I stop, I show an African American movie, mm. you know. So now I'm teaching them about my culture too. Mm. Mm. I'm teaching mm. them about my culture. When my company brings people here on birthright journeys and those people get to sit and talk with them, they're learning about African American culture. Mm. True. Right. True. Our job is to do our part, and our part is to do the best that we can while we're here. It's Africa for everybody. Afri you said, is, is it for everybody? Yeah. Hell no. Not only is it not for everybody, I'm like, if it's not for you, stay your ass home, because mm. you're gonna make it harder for us over here who's trying to make something happen. Mm. I know you've been bringing a lot of people. Have you had problem with you know people coming here and just you know probably not acting? the way they no, no we we i think we do a good job of managing expectations mm. training and preparation mm. um if that's one of the things that i can say my company does really well we do a lot of things well but that's one of them managing expectations training preparation and we curate the journeys so we don't bring anybody here and drop them mm. off from the time you get to the airport to the time you leave is somebody with you the number of Zoom calls and sessions that we have with you prior to coming. Mm. The packet of information that we give you that tells you you don't greet with the left hand, you greet from right to left when you come in, this is what you do when you go to a palace, etc. The information that we provide, the cultural information helps people prepare for mm. themselves for the trip. So that we don't have people acting out. And we do a good job of managing expectations, but one of the biggest things that our people see when they come is customer service. Mm. Mm. They, they don't get it. Why do we have to wait so long? Or why are the people, like, they didn't get it? Like, it's certain things, like, in the U.S., you can go to a restaurant and you can order a dish. And if you don't like it, you send it back. And they'll try something else. You and they're going to take here. this off the bill. Not regularly. Like, you got to fight mm -hmm. to get that off your bill. Because they like, it's already made. And if you want something else, you need to pay for it. You're like, but I don't like it. And they like, that's not my problem. Mm different culture. Mm. 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 I had somebody, something that they do in Ghana, I realized I was like, I need to be a comedian and tell a spoof about this. <laughs> mm. They will say, it's coming up right now. Mm. Oh, it's coming right now. And I'm like, why do you feel like you need to tell me that when you know it's not coming right now? To patience. <laughs> why not just not say anything? Say it one time convincingly. So your food will be coming up in 20 minutes. And don't say nothing else to me for 20 minutes. Mm. Mm. But don't come back to me in 15 minutes and say it's coming up right now. Mm. <laughs> and then I got to wait another 15 minutes. So now I'm 10 over the additional 20 and you're still telling me it's coming right now. But what you learn here is that it's the language difference. Mm. It's what it means, mm. how people talk. Mm. And it's really them. They really want to apologize for you waiting and they don't know how to so they just keep saying it's coming right now it's coming right now mm -hmm. but if you're not from here if you're not used to this you're gonna be like yo yeah you're very passionate about bringing people to some continent very very passionate being with through your company mm -hmm. what, what vision do you see why are you bringing thousands and thousands of people to africa i believe that black people in america specifically need to know that they have options mm. Mm. I'm not saying that when you move, you have some people who move and say, I ain't never going back. I'm not one of those. I still got family there. <laughs> I still got to go to the go-go. Mm. I still like to watch a walk in sport zone and get me a fresh pair of 998 New Balance. <laughs> it's things about my culture that I can't get here. Mm. The same way a Ghanaian could be in America and be like, oh, I have fufu here, but it's not like fufu same from my Ghana. village. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a part of them wanting to go home is not just to go home. It's, I miss everything about home. Everything that I love about home that's not here, I miss. Mm -hmm. The things that you don't like about home, you don't miss. So it's the same for me. Right? When I go, I, I need, like I was just telling somebody, yo, when I go back, like, I got to go to the go-go. Like, it's just, that's me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's something about, you know, me taking my granddaughter to the mall. 
and just walking up and down the mall with her, letting her buy ice cream, cookies, things like that. Mm -hmm. Or me being, a walk, being able to walk into a certain store. Or me being able to go to one of my favorite places that I just go to. Hmm. Someone would say there's a mall in our crowd, so. <laughs> there is, but it's different. It's a different kind of mall. Hmm. Hmm. Retail shopping is still fairly new in Ghana. It's only 15 years old. Hmm. Hmm. So the malls here are very, very different. Otherwise, there will be so many more. Mm -hmm. True. Right? True. True. Because we still can buy stuff a lot cheaper at the market. So even like me, it. I'm looking at the market. I ain't getting everything out the mm -hmm. mall. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, that is a challenge. That is something that you would always go back to the U.S. for. I, I know a lot of people, not really a challenge, but it's something that you, you know, want to go back. I had other people who moved to the continent, you know, who, you know, kind of find it hard to fit in. They might not have some conveniences and they end up leaving. Yes. You know, we have, unfortunately, there are probably far more horror stories than success stories. Hmm. Okay, hmm. so let's get into this. Yes. It's probably far more horror stories than success stories. And that's for several reasons. One, you have to do your due diligence and prepare. You have to do your due diligence and prepare. Two, there's this thing here that we call the black tax. Hmm. Hmm. What is that? When you hear my accent, it costs more. <laughs> right? Yeah. I literally just came from the Lands Commission today mm. to register land I have. Mm. Guess where I was? In the car. Because Not in the office. Because when they see you, the price goes up. Or something. Mm. No black tax. So it's the black tax that hurts us. And sometimes it's pure outright dishonesty. Right. If somebody sells the same plot of land seven times over, that's not a mistake, bro. Mm. You're but, a crook. But someone would say we went to school in China and other countries and Chinese pay Chinese fees and we pay foreigners fees. Yep. So someone would say it's not a Ghanaian thing. Stockholm enough. syndrome. You know, Stockholm syndrome Elaborate is on that. people should look up Stockholm syndrome is when people fall in love with their oppressor. Mm. Hmm. That's one of the things that indigenous Africans are going to have to come face to face with and deal with. Professor Lumumba talks about it all of the time. Hmm. We have a serious thing of Stockholm Syndrome. Indigenous African people love their oppressors more. Hmm. If I'm in a store and there's a white person in the store in Ghana, the average Ghanaian person in that store will rush to help this white person before me. That's very true. Even you say it's true. That's very true. Or Lebanese or this. Because we either see them as having more money, as priority. I don't know. So mental slavery is true. It's real. a mental slavery issue. It happens. Stockholm Syndrome. We love our oppressors. Now, we coming from a place where our oppressors whipped us and hung us and raped our mothers in our face. It's harder for us mm -hmm. to love them. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so when we see them, we like, what? Mm -hmm. So we have those differences, but... They're just opposite sides of the same coin. It's opposite sides of the same coin. What we have to do is learn to be extra patient with ourselves and our people because we know the uniqueness of our history. Now, you prepare a lot of people for the continent, but do we prepare Africans for the diaspora? Uh -huh. Now, whose job is that? <laughs> they are watching. <laughs> <laughs> whose job is that? And I'm glad you said that because... This is something that needs to happen. Mm. And I'm currently the president of the African American Association of Ghana, mm. which was started by a group of people about 30 years ago who wanted to have a soft place to land for mm. people coming to Ghana and support system for each other. And that association has grown over the years. And I'm the president for this year. Mm. It's a blessing and That's it's an amazing. honor to be president. One of the things that we're going to have to start to deal with, mm. right, is 2023. Mm -hmm. We are four years out of the year of return, mm -hmm. right? Going into the fifth year, mm -hmm. right? Am I right? Do I got yeah. my math right? 2019, yeah. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. This is the fifth, fifth year. year. Sorry. So when we say the year of return and beyond the return, these seven pillars, we're going to have to begin to dive a little bit deeper into what they are and what they do. And the people whose job it is, are going to have to do a better job hmm. at explaining, at sharing what that is. Hmm. What is happening? Mm -hmm. What are the opportunities? 
how do you make it known what are the resources being allocated to it because right now and i can honestly say mm. probably the first term and the second term and i'm, I'm not a political analyst mm -hmm. but the year of return in in his excellency's first state of the union he led off with the year of return yeah that's going to be one of the legacies of his presidency. Yes, sir. Is the fact that the yes. year of return happened before it was uh, free high school, and now it's before it was free <laughs> high school, right? Yeah. So the question is, if that's one of the legacies mm. of this of a four year term, then what is left? Mm. What is it? Mm. 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 Why do people still have problems finding out how to get residency? Why mm. are th some things still But unclear? why is it so, though? Because I find I've had people tell me that getting citizenship after relocating in Ghana is extremely very difficult. Well, and so, let me say this. Mm. The misnomer about citizenship is not anybody's fault. Mm. The day that the president announced the year of return, I was there. And the next day, all of the headlines said get Ghanaian citizenship. He didn't say that. Mm, mm. He said, come home, we wel you are welcome. But we interpreted it as citizenship. I've had people ask me, I heard you get citizenship once you buy land. Mm. I heard once you get your Ghana card, you get citizenship. Mm. I heard this, I heard But what that. is the threshold? Is there a threshold for it? I don't know what they're hearing. And I don't know who they're listening to. The only way to get citizenship right now, clearly, mm. is through naturalization. Mm. Elaborate on that. That's it. Naturalization is you spend five to seven years in a country. You have a valid residency permit for each year that you're mm -hmm. here. And then once you've gone through those basic things, you got your five years, your proof of this, your proof of that. You go to the Ministry of Interior and you apply. Mm. And That's there have been people who've been waiting for 20 years. There's the only way right now. Mm. The, the reason why I got my citizenship and how others have gotten their citizenship is through the will of the president. Mm. Mm. His Excellency Nanado or Kufado. Mm -hmm as a part of the year of return, committed to giving out a certain number of citizenships. Mm. He did half of those in 2019, and at the end of 2022, he fulfilled his commitment for the other half. Mm. Prior to him, former President John Muhammad was the first mm -hmm. to give citizenship mm -hmm. to a group of about 16, 26, I forget the exact number. And there are a number of African-American diasporans and people here who are the ones who've led that charge for citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to say I'm not one of them. But a lot of people think that is stopping them from making money on the continent on business. No. Quest. But Lebanese is not having citizenship, but yeah, making yeah, money. Most people want citizenship because the citizenship is tied to our romantic relationship to the continent of Africa. Hmm. It's been the place that's kept us, that's been kept from us the longest. It's been the place that we've been told not to go to. So it's just a thing. It's like watching James Bond. You open up a safe, you got two Glocks, hmm. you got money hmm. in different currencies, and you got six passports right we just want dual passports mm. we want we want options everybody wants options right. right but most people don't know exactly what they would do with mm -hmm. it or why mm. i would always say one of the biggest benefits of having a ghanaian passport or any ECOWAS nation is now you got 15 countries you can travel to visa free yeah mm -hmm. at the drop of a dime mm -hmm. that's all right around you I mean sometimes you have to pay at the border <laughs> even some if you especially if you're traveling by road road yeah right mm -hmm. but technically ECOWAS you're not supposed to pay right Mm -hmm. So, and there are other benefits. Most people here don't know if you're an African American or a non Ghanaian citizen, citizen and you buy land, you are only entitled to 50 years on your indenture. Mm. You're not entitled to 99 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Unless you know somebody special, you got a hookup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They that land will never be registered in your name. Mm. If wow. you do not have a Ghanaian passport and your indenture says 99 years and you go through the true real process, when you get to the lands commission to register it, they're going to send it back and you, it's going to get kicked back and you got to get a new indenture. So to anyone having a 99 year document and it's a diaspora and should. It, unless they co-sign by a Ghanaian. Ghanaian, okay. Hmm. Unless you co-sign by a Ghanaian. Hmm. And don't, now I ain't the expert at this. Somebody mm -hmm. might challenge me. I could be wrong, but that's, that's as far as what I know from my research. Hmm. 99 wow. years. Wow. Wow. So I'm saying that in, in, I don't want people to feel like I'm saying there's something wrong with wanting citizenship. Everybody wants it. Hell, I got it here. I got it in the U.S. And I still want it at a number of other places. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get another passport, I'm going for it. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Just because world travel and being able to move around will get you that. I like that. But we are connected to the continent of Africa. Although we had this 400-year gap, mm. it's in our DNA, bro. Mm -hmm. They, they, didn't take, they couldn't take our memory. 
They couldn't take our ancestral memory. They couldn't take the things we love. They couldn't take our rhythm. They couldn't take our looks, our feels. And they definitely didn't take the spirit that connects us. That's why most African-American people getting to Africa is such an emotional thing. Mm. How many people you see get off the plane and kiss the ground? Yeah. You never thought you would make it. Mm. Bro, the door of no return is real. Mm. 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 These colonizers literally, literally thought there's no way they can ever return here after all that we've done. Mm -hmm. And people are returning. And not only are we returning, we returning fresh. We look good. We smell good. We got money in our pocket. We enjoying. We popping bottles. We building communities. We in development. We learning tree. Cra, 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 cra. Cra, cra, cra. <laughs> right? We doing all of these things that you're not supposed to do when you go through that. Mm, mm, mm. Let's, uh, let's send advice to our African Americans, brothers, diasporans, and Canadians on what exactly they need to start doing now in order to prepare themselves for the continent of Africa. So, great. If you are, if you want to move mm. and repatriate, mm -hmm. right? Not just visit, because visiting is easy. Visiting, you can come to my company, theadinkergroup.com. We can curate a birthright journey for you. You can go to any other company. You can go with AfricanAncestry.com. You can actually trace your DNA through AfricanAncestry.com. Mm -hmm. Find out your modern day country and ethnic group that you're from maternally or paternally and then travel mm -hmm. to that place mm -hmm. and then reconnect literally with the ethnic group. Did you check yours? Yes, of course I did. Mm -hmm. Maternally, uh, Fulani people of present day Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Paternally, Gabon. Ateke mm -hmm. people of Gabon. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's number... The first thing I would tell people to do is know your why. Mm -hmm. What is your why? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to come? Why do you want to move? Why do you want to stay? Take some time to figure out your why, especially for repatriation. Mm -hmm. Visiting, you don't need a reason. Mm -hmm. If Africa is open and you can come, so come. But come with an open mind. I like that. Come with an open mind. And come with an open mind both ways. Mm -hmm. Don't come thinking that you got to have a village experience. Mm -hmm. I got people, I'm telling them, listen, you ain't got to touch a village when you come. Mm. Mm. We could stay on rooftops and pop cold bottles of champagne the whole time you're here. Hennessy, mm. VSOP, what you want? Everything yeah. is here. Mm -hmm. You want to ride around in a Land Cruiser or a Benz? Like, which one you want? We, we, can, get, we can get to somebody who got a Ferrari. Yeah. We can find a Bentley to rent. Like, yeah. if those are your standards and that's what you feel like you need, you can have it. Just be prepared to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It's kind of expensive. Hey, Akra is expensive. <laughs> well, this is the thing. It's a, it's a cash society, not a credit society. Mm. Elaborate to that, people who don't understand what well, that is. Well, it's a cash-based society. Everything costs cash, mm -hmm. liquid. If you see somebody driving down the street with a Bentley, they pay for it, and they paid the duty, so they paid one and a half times the cost of a Bentley. Mm. If you see a Ferrari, Porsche, the same thing. Most people don't know if you move into Ghana and you want to pay rent, you got to pay your rent three, six, 12 months in advance, sometimes two years in advance, all cash. Why? Because credit is too expensive. Mm. Credit is going to cost you somewhere between 12 and 23 mm. percent. Right. Mm -hmm. So for every dollar you borrow, you got to pay back a dollar 12 or a dollar 23 cents. That's mm -hmm. expensive mm -hmm. when you start getting up there in numbers, especially if it's compound interest mm -hmm. versus simple interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a cash based society, which I kind of like. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, it took me a while to learn it. But I appreciate paying my year up front and then not having that monthly bill. Mm -hmm. Do you feel more free and relaxed with that kind of system compared to the U.S.? But I feel free and relaxed if it was both. Mm. That you can just... If you can choose. choose. Mm. The thing is that most people are going to choose credit mm. if you don't have to spend your own cash. Because mm. mm. the rest of the world is credit-based. It's mainly Africa and other places that are not credit-based. The rest of the world. But, I mean... Ah, I like cash. I like credit. I like, I just like being able to get things done. I mm -hmm. like clear processes. Help me mm -hmm. figure out a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That back to your uh, original question about how to prepare. Mm. So one, know your why. If you're coming to repatriate, and again, if you're coming to visit, just come. Whoever is bringing you to Africa, make sure you do your research on them. Mm. It's a long trip. A due diligence. Do your due diligence. I've had people who've come with me and had the best experience of their life. Mm. And I've had people earlier on in our career who
who didn't have a good time. And we learn from those situations mm -hmm. on how and what to do to make sure that everybody has a good time. It's too far to come to not have a bad experience. Mm -hmm. We've already worked so hard to get you to accept Africa. Now to come in and have a bad experience, most people are going to be unforgiven. Mm -hmm. If you go to Paris and you have a bad experience, you're going to say it's just Paris. I'll try better la next time. Mm -hmm. If you come to Africa and have a bad experience, I told you we shouldn't have brought our ass to Africa. I ain't coming back. Yeah. Why do we have that attitude, though? You're going to be unforgiven. You can, look how hard we had to fight to get you to come. Hmm. Even to get the Tarzan jungle, you're going to get kidnapped mentality out your mind. We're traveling a further distance. That's why. Hmm. We've been told our whole life, pa Paris, London, Spain, and all of these other places is exotic. And Africa is the black, dark jungle where you might get eaten by lions and kidnapped. So how far is the distance that your mind has to travel from there to come into Africa than from exotic? Hmm. Hmm. You in America, you ain't been nowhere exotic. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so for you to go to Europe is a dream. I have the Eiffel Tower and hmm. all of these other European signs of uh, uh, greatness. Hmm. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Hmm. Hmm. So it's easy to go to those places, hmm. but also it's less expensive. Hmm. Really? A ticket to Europe from America? Oh, yeah, it's way cheaper than the ticket. To, yeah, true. Why is hell a ticket? A ticket from Ghana to Senegal is going to cost between six hundred and a thousand dollars. Yeah, I can get to South Africa, Kenya, and maybe even to Europe cheaper than I can get to Senegal. Wow. That has to do with fuel. That has to do with airlines. It has to do with access. It has to do with all of these things. Mm -hmm. That's why the Africa Free Trade Agreement is so important. Mm. Because once the Africa Free Trade Agreement is reached. And we kind of begin to erase these borders. And now we have all of these multilateral agreements between African countries. I hope it translates into airlines and fuel. Mm -hmm. Imagine, man, if I could pay $2.99 to go to Senegal, to go to any African country, just $2.99 flat. Mm -hmm. huh. Please. Yeah. You know how many people going to be over here? <laughs> <laughs> your, your guide, your book, that you've, you wrote a book. Yes. Your smart guide uh, to Africa. Now, you literally have a QR code to businesses, to people who can be of help to diasporans, yep. you know, coming uh, to Ghana. So they don't have to go through the hectic, the, the hassle that you did when you initially. Exactly. Why did you want, want to just hand I, out <laughs> free? I was, it, so two things. One, it was during the pandemic. Mm. I was here in the village during the pandemic trying to figure out how to stop eating cookies mm. like everybody else. What do I do with myself, right? The good thing about being in Africa is we were still outside. Mm, mm. I tell people all the time, in America, they'd be happy, like, we outside this weekend, we outside, but like, yo, Africa, we live outside, bro. Mm. Like, that whole we outside thing, I know y'all excited because y'all outside, but we always outside in Africa, <laughs> always outside. So y'all remember that, we always outside in Africa. We invented outside. Um, I wanted to help people because of the amount of misinformation that I was hearing and that was going around. Mm. It was just a lot of misinformation. The Let, book has well, 20 one chapters. <laughs> one, one was about citizenship. Mm. Mm. One was about citizenship, that you can just come and get citizenship because of the year of return. One was about land. Mm. Land is what, what probably one of the most litigious uh, 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 judicial s system cases that, that happens in Ghana. Land cases? Land cases. Being cheated? Being cheated, discrepancies. How many big buildings do you see not finished because it's, it's they in court? Mm. And then, you know, if you're going against somebody rich, they just keep Waste you tied up in court until your money, until you let it go. Mm -hmm. So most people don't understand in Ghana you have different types of land. Most people don't know the difference between stool land, family land, personal land, government land. Which one should they stay away from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> The most dangerous is probably family land, mm. in my opinion. Mm. And that's because there's no document, there's no legal document that says who the head of the family is that has the authorization to sign it. So if an uncle, he could be an elderly man who you trust, this old man is not lying to me, cheating me. And he signs that document and sells you this family's plot of land. And then another family member comes back and says, he's not the Abusia Penin of the family. Mm. Abusia Penin. He can't sign it. So it's null and void. The court is like, his signature means nothing. You just bought a piece of paper, but not the rights to this land. Mm. Because you can't own this particular land 
unless they're Busia Panyin, mm. this person, auntie, grandma, unless these three signatures are mm. on this family land, it's not valid. Mm. And you don't, you can't get that in the book. Have you had people You can get that in my you? book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't get that anywhere else unless you meet Ghanaian people and talk to them and understand. Have you had some cases come to you personally? For land? Yeah. I've had people that I know run into situations mm. and I've tried to, you know, at that point it's like, get a lawyer, bro. Mm. At that point there's nothing I can do. I can help educate you on what might be the problem, but you done already made the cash transaction. Mm. You done already spent the bread. Mm. Mm. So if you already spent the bread, there's nothing we could do. You got to get a lawyer mm. and decide, am I going to stay lawyered up? How much am I going to spend in, in the court versus how much I'm, am I just going to let it walk? Mm. Lesson wow. learned. It's an expensive lesson. I'll move on and try to, you know, like, so that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. The book is called A Smart Ghana Repatriation Guide. It's 20 chapters. Um, we have over 100 dynamic QR codes throughout the book. Uh, we did that so we wouldn't have to write such a voluminous edition of the book. And the QR codes help to expand the content in every chapter. So you can find it on Amazon. It's called A Smart Ghana Repatriation Guide. Now, a lady I interviewed said she told her mom, that why she's on retirement and she said why wouldn't you travel to Africa where your US dollars or Canadian dollars would reach far than in Canada and she told her daughter that she would rather be broke in Canada America than to come to the continent good for her stay broke in Canada <laughs> there's some people you can't there's some people you'll never be able to respond to the things that they say or why. No but problem. But we have to free them because Africa is beautiful. Yeah, but you can't do that for everybody. Indeed. You got to pick and choose your battles. Now, that's her battle because that's her mom. And she wants her mom to travel to Africa. So she's going to spend time convincing her mom. And if you're a good friend of hers, you should work with her to convince her mom. But for me and you, good. Mm. Until you decide that you're ready to come and you want to come, no problem. Mm. Like, you just can't. You have a message, though, to our brothers who are willing to listen. Mm -hmm. Listen to you. Even just embark on the journey to find out if Africa is meant for them. What would that message be? Africa is out of sight, out of mind. You can't do Africa via satellite. You got to show up. Showing up is number one, especially if you want to do business. Mm. You can manage your businesses in the United States from Africa better than you can manage your businesses in Africa from the United States. Mm. You got to be here. Number one advice is show up. Like, they got this thing where they say jump and grow wings. Especially if you're an entrepreneur, I'm going to just give you, if you're an entrepreneur or working remotely in your job, your source of income, does not require you to be in an office in a physical location at any given point of any time of the year and you can work from home a coffee shop whatever and you're making at least I'm gonna just say seventy five thousand dollars a year bare minimum you owe yourself a visit to Africa you don't have to look for opportunities they smack you in the face mm. Mm. you don't have to look for opportunities You'll have so many ideas and things that pop up to you and you'll run into so many things that you'll see that you'll have to calm yourself down and make sure you choose one mm. and focus because mm. there's so many. Mm. If you're somebody who's making $150,000 a year, you're wasting your time. Yeah, it's long overdue. You're wasting your time. Come to Africa, choose your country, come to Ghana. Ghana is the softest place to land for most people. It's English speaking. They're used to African-Americans. It's probably one of the most developed West African nations that's there. And it makes sense. Mm. Mm. It's yep. the Black Star, first independent African country. Mm. It makes sense, right? Now, if you're making over 300000 or half a million dollars a year as an entrepreneur, even a business person, you owe yourself a visit. Mm. Now, if you're somebody who's making any of those amounts of money and you feel like you have an obligation to help black people, to help young people or whatever, it's an obligation for you not only to help get yourself over here, but to go into the communities in your hometown in America and bring young people from those communities and help give them the opportunity to come and change their environment and see it. I like that. You grew up, you said, in the ghettos. 
in the hood, not in the necessarily hood, in, the in the ghetto, ghetto. I'm, in the hood. I'm, I'm, in the I got hood. some people, some of <laughs> my family members going to see like, this nigga ain't from the hood. <laughs> <laughs> we in the hood. Yeah. The hood is always around the corner. Mm. And the hood is not just the neighborhood you live in, it's the experiences that you have. So mm. let me just say that. Because, mm. you know, if you ain't got no bullet wounds, then people feel like you ain't yeah, been in yeah. the hood. <laughs> I was like that because we do have that equivalent here. Like, how do we go? Zongos, right? Yeah, then the But zongos. in America, that is different. The safety, the, there's a lot of uh, meta among mm. black people there, even meta in general. And you growing up from from environment like that, what did that do to your mind, you know, growing up and how you escaped that? Pool. Two weeks after I moved to D.C., somebody got killed on my front gate. Wow. A month later, somebody was shot on my porch. Mm. Now, what does that do to you? What does that do to somebody? You definitely walk around with your head on a swivel. Mm. You definitely are moving around a little differently. You definitely, you may lose some hope and definitely feel like any day it could happen, so I'm just always going to be ready kind of thing. Mm. Um, but that's as a younger person. As you get older, you learn how to make decisions that move you out of those situations and out of those places. And you also make different decisions as to who your friends are and who are around you. Mm. Your interests become different. So mm. once you go to college and this, yeah, you got 40 year old thugs, these people who just haven't grown up mm. or they haven't learned how to do something else. And mm. they still in the hood doing the same thing that you might have been doing with them 15 years ago. Dog, I'm not 18 no more. Mm. You on the same block doing the same thing. I was there with you when we was 18. Even if I wasn't doing what you was doing, I just hung out. I knew what was happening. I was around. But now we 40. Why is it so hard that we can't, some of our brothers can't move away from that lifestyle? Man, um, it's quick, it's easy, it's exciting. Mm. That's all. Some of us are a little bit lazy. And some of us are trapped. Some of it is systematic racism. Some of it is because the American government is set up is that once you've gone to jail for a felony, it's hard to get a job. And if you got to take care of your family, you got to do what you got to do. Hmm. I'm not saying that anybody's justified to sell crack in the community or to murder, to rob, steal and kill. I'm not saying that, but it's not a simple one plus one equal two. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm lucky enough, like my kids ain't never been sitting at home starving with me not being able to get a job. Mm, mm. But what do I tell a man mm. who has a wife or not, kids or not, maybe mom, dad has a family that they have to feed. Mm. And they've done everything that they can in their power to stay positive. They've tried to get a job, but because of a misstep or some transgression that they had when they were younger, and they wound up in the penal system, they got out, but because it was a felony or whatever it was, now they can't get a job, they gotta say it, people are judging them based on their past, and it's, they can't make a certain amount of wage. Like, mm. what do I tell that man? True. Mm. Mm. Sure. Mm -hmm. all, all you can say is keep your head up, bro. Yeah. I've had people move in to the continent and they said they're moving because America is doomed. You, you love to go there back and forth. Do you think America is doomed? In the prophecy way? Uh, well, I think that the world is cyclic and everything's a cycle. It's definitely a different cycle right now. And I don't know if that cycle is America's doomsday or not. Mm. I'm not a conspiracy theorist mm. kind of thing. Mm. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about the American dollar is going to fall and it's going to be replaced on the world stage. I don't believe that, mm. mainly because I believe that America's too egotistical mm -hmm. and they would start a war before that happens. Mm. Mm. I'm like, a war will happen before the American dollar falls, mark my word. No way America will allow the dollar to not be the world standard. Mm. It'll be some war, something gonna happen. Mm. Some, there's gonna be another bombing or something in America and they gotta attack another Arab nation, something, Bin Laden's gonna came back, something. <laughs> Some I, I just, <laughs> yo, I can't put that past America. Look what it's put my people through. I can't put nothing past them. <laughs> wow. This you understand guys. what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I can't. Like, it, it, it just, it is what it is. Mm. And I'm not even focused on them. Mm. I'm focused on building and doing what I got to do in my lifetime for my family. I for like AC, that. my granddaughter. I like that. I've like, used... what, most people lose focus. Um and forget 
that they need to be focused and worried about what it is that they're doing in their lifetime. I like that. What are you accomplishing in your lifetime? Yes, you're going to leave something for your kids and this, that, and the third. But before you die, what are the things that you want to accomplish? What mm. do you want to say you have done? What have you gotten done for yourself? What have you left to show the rest of the world? I've done the best that I can with all that I have of what God has given me while I have been here during this physical experience. Mm. No. That's what happens when you die. They don't take, you don't take nothing with you. Mm -hmm. All you do is leave something. Mm. And what is the best thing to possibly leave? Institutions, ideas, things that have helped other people grow and be better. I like that. And you doing that and you've done that with a community center in, the, in this village. I know one. Uh. Yo. When we finish, this will light up at night. Oh wow, that would be beautiful. Yes, so what I wanted to do was, what was important for me was, I wanted to make sure that, you know, sometimes they have this concept, mm -hmm. people kind of thing, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. that if you build or do something here, you don't need to do it to world standards, to international standards mm -hmm. or world standards because it's good enough for Africa. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that when we put a community center here, it could rival or it could be transplanted to anywhere else in the U.S. Mm. When we finish this building, the style of it, the design and everything that's going to be inside of it, if you could pick it up and move it, you could pick it up and move it. You could put it in Miami. You could put it in New York. You could put it in, 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 in New York. You could put it in Florida. You can put it in any one of these places, but and, it'll fit right and it's in. not because those are the places that decide. Well, in the world, those are the places that decide. But we're not saying, oh, we want to be like them. Mm. We're just saying that people on the African continent, and for me, since I'm a coastal Henny of this village, people of Yame Bechere deserve and should have something of a high standard too. Mm -hmm. Yes. You also opened up uh, the, the, there's a spot, co-working space in Accra. Yes. So what we did is we used our office space and expanded it mm. for other diasporans. Mm -hmm. So we have other diasporans who are coming to Ghana. Mm. Maybe you come into Ghana, you don't want to rent your own space yet. You don't have the business to have your own space. You don't need your own space. You don't want your own space or anything like that, right? Maybe that's happening. Well, you have a space you can come rent a desk. You can mm -hmm. rent a conference room. We got a podcast studio. You can come use the projector, use the screen. You can rent it for small scale trainings. If you got a staff of five to 10, 15, up to 20 people, you want to host, you know. So it's, it's just really an expansion of the work that we're already doing. Again, that continues to help support what we're doing here and mm -hmm. the development that we do here. So it's all tied in. It's Africa the future. Africa's the past, present, and future. I like that. It's the past, present, and future. Hmm. Africa is the uh, uh, progenitor of civilization. Hmm. The oldest known human being known to man was found in Africa. Hmm. Every modern science is known to have been discovered in Africa. The written language was known to have been discovered in Africa. I'm sure you've, you've heard Ghanaians say the white man is very smart when they see technologies that are very impressive. Have you, have Most of the things that make those technologies work were made by black people. Mm -hmm. Cell phones. <laughs> All of these things. They might have done the marketing and this, that, and the third, but it's, it's really done by black but people. Do you think we are teaching our children enough of black act achievements here in Ghana? On no. The continent? Don't even get me started on the educational system mm. because I believe they still teach from a colonial perspective here. Do you know there's a If I had children in Ghana, they would never ever go to a public school, ever. Wow. Probably not even a private school because they're not learning about how to be African children. Mm. They're learning how to be sub subordinate and mm. they're learning how to be under Europeans because you're, you're taught that Europeans are the greatest. So you're still learning about European history, European technology, European school. Everything is European as the greatest. They don't even talk to you about African history. Hmm. Hmm. How many African high school students can name every African country? Hmm. But they probably can name every European country. Hmm. Wow. How come they don't know about all of the great African civilizations? How come they don't know the names of the f most famous pyramids and Kemet in Egypt? 
How come they don't know about the great kings, kings and rulers of Africa? Because they were told it was not built by them and the Afro exactly. Palace. Guys, this conversation is very interesting. <laughs> He's very knowledgeable uh, man and has done so much on the continent. He has experienced it, lived it and, you know, has wrote, written a book that is going to help you embark on a journey. You know, I really encourage a lot of people, this interview that we do and other videos that I do is to encourage people to see the positive side of Africa, to see that Africa is not the shithole like Trump said, <laughs> but it's really a great place that you, you should visit, you know, in your lifetime. I had Tim Sway on the show and then he said every African-American should at least visit Africa before they die. One time, hmm. at a very minimum, one time. That's our goal. I'm working on some type of campaign, I think maybe by... 2025 and hopefully I'll be able to get other tour companies that all do tourism to Ghana and to Africa I'd love to see some kind of counter on the web mm. Mm. like we, let's just all agree that we're going to bring a million people a million Africans of the diaspora to Ghana by 2025 in two years by 2025 maybe 2030 I don't know. I'm just sharing it. Free bag of cookies. It's an idea somebody can run with. Wow. Right? But something like that, we need a call to action. Hmm. We need something like that. Like, hey, if you are in the black travel space, or if you believe in black excellence, and if you believe, you know, in black people, in resilience, and in our power, and if you believe that Africa is the center, and that everybody else is investing in Africa, and we should... Join us and let's help bring one million black people to Africa by 2030. Now, I see you like Michael Max a lot. <laughs> he, you know, so there are some people who say that I don't want to go to Africa. Michael Max came, right? My book was released on May 19th. Which is... Uh, Michael Max's he... birthday. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> you have no excuse. We are almost at the end May of the 19th, conversation, guys. If it's your first time here, please don't forget to like the video. You know, comment down below. Let's get an engagement going. If you agree with what he's saying, comment down. If you don't, what's your mind? Comment down below and uh, check out his book. I recommend you to read it. It's, there's so much knowledge in there. Um, it, it's guide to, you, you know, to Africa and they help you not make mistakes, you know, that people made here in the continent. So we are almost at the end. If you do have a, a final message to, to the people, what would that message be? Um... My final message, I will probably just, you know, re-emphasize what you said is that please support the book. Um, a Smart Ghana Repatriation Guide, you can get it on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and type in a Smart Ghana Repatriation Guide. If you have not traveled to the continent of Africa, Ghana, or someplace else, and maybe you want some assistance with that, you can contact us at www.theadinkergroup.com. Um... And if you're in Ghana, traveling to Ghana soon, you're an entrepreneur, you're a remote worker traveling through or whatever, you might need a kind of a space to work out of. Check us out at Kazi.network. Mm, I right? like that. Kazi.network. Okay. Um, and reach out. You know what I'm saying? Follow me on social media, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hit me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, let's build. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, so I hope that people have found something in this conversation useful, motivational. I want to thank you for traveling out this way, for tracking me down, for calling, <laughs> for being patient, for waiting thank for me you. to call you back <laughs> <laughs> to do this. Um, so I appreciate you. Thank you so um, much. And I, I wish you a lot of success with your family mm. and your channel. Mm. I appreciate your candidness, your candor, and, um, and the questions that you ask and the amount of time that you take to develop a good product. I like that. Thank you so much for You're being welcome. on the show.